Hello everyone. In this video lecture, I'm going to offer some, some concluding comments on chapter 9 of The Island of Dr. Moreau, reflecting on the status of the bees people. From there, we'll summarize the ensuing chapters. I'll offer just a few quick comments that will lead into our conversations regarding those chapters in our interactive class, and then summarize chapter 14, which will be at the heart of many of our reflections when it comes time for us to meet on Wednesday. Another video lecture will follow that will provide you with some contextualizing information regarding the Victorian social climate surrounding vivisection, the various different initiatives that were put in place to try to combat this uh, process and procedure as a moral evil, and the defenses that were raised against its necessity. All of these things in the next video lecture will help you to understand Dr. Moreau's defense and ultimately the way in which Wells himself is grappling with the issues of scientific advancement, exploration, and the various different medical procedures that arose from this form of research technique. In chapter nine, we see what we later learned to be the influence and impacts of Dr. Moreau's attempts to humanize and transform the beast people from animals into quasi human beings to try to break down the boundary between animal and man by way of surgical procedures that can then be adapted to affect human beings in the same way. If animals are infinitely mutable, if that raw material of animals can be reshaped and reformed into anything that he desires, so too could human beings have any kind of congenital defect or any kind of flaw within their composition corrected and reconfigured into something that fits the mores, norms, expectations, or requirements of society. These creatures, however, have been lost in a liminal space between animal and man, and Dr. Moreau seems to have lost sight of the humanity that he is seeking to create, because these creatures have been granted nothing more than a sense of shame. They are able to strive to articulate desires for something more, something that they can't really understand. They can gesture towards the law, grope blindly in the darkness for some kind of humanity that forever loons them. As we see in chapter 9, the beast people possess a tremendous sense of guilt and shame for the desires that they are prevented from actualizing. They can only travel out into the wilderness, escape from their village the, in order to suck up drink, tear off their clothing, bray, howl, and gibber in the face of the moonlight. It's only in the darkness, it's only in those forgotten hidden spaces that they're, they feel as if they can satiate those drives because they know they shouldn't do so. Moreau, as I said, has imprinted upon them a sense of shame for those desires and a sense or an understanding of those desires. And they are torn apart by the law, rent at the very core of their being by the necessity of adhering to the social conventions that have been imposed upon them by the law and by Moreau, and also by the desires that are animalistic and bestial that they can't really understand. They have a desperate desire not to be seen as animalistic, as the creature that is drinking from the well or from the, the stream looks up in horror and terror, revulsion at his at himself when Prendrick falls upon him or the three beast people who are braying and howling at the moon. All of these creatures avoid conflict and contact during the day, but the creature that was sucking up his drink attacks the narrator as darkness falls. That darkness, the cover of darkness, hiding his sins, is something that calls upon his ancient instincts, and his shame as a beast can only be suppressed sufficiently, and that bestial nature can only come to the forefront under the cover of darkness. It is not merely that on the one hand, the knight calls to his predatory instincts, but that it assuages the human sentiment of guilt for violating the law that's been ingrained in them, stamped on them, and carved into their flesh by Moreau's vivisection experiments. Their actions and gesticulations betray an irrevocable inhumanity. Returning to that quotation that we discussed in the last video, each of these creatures, despite its human form, its rag of clothing, and the rough humanity of its bodily form, had woven into it, into its movements, into the expressions and its countenance, into its whole presence, some now irresistible suggestion of a hog, a swinish taint, the unmistakable mark of the beast. Charles Darwin, who of course developed his theory of evolution by way of essentially mutation and uh, natural selection, 
suggested that man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. In this moment, H.G. Wells is probably alluding to a concept similar to that in his depiction of the Beast People, that these creatures, no matter how evolved they may seem, no matter how evolution or Moreau's hand shapes them into something that parodies or approximates humanity, will always bear within them the mark of the beast, that swinish taint, something repugnant, alien, almost blasphemous and demonic, as the mark of the beast from the Christian Bible, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, is a sign of demonic ownership. The Antichrist or the beast stamps human beings with the mark of the beast to denote that he is in possession of them. So there's something horribly blasphemously demonic in this moment. These beast people and man cannot escape their origins. Nothing can. All are constrained and confined by their physical being and their evolutionary origin, regardless of the fact that they desire more. For instance, we saw that Maling, as he looks up into the stars, questing after something, longing for a beauty, an articulation of beauty, and a transcendent experience that is denied to him forever, can long for it, can want it. But that's the pain of human experience, of animal experience, and that's one and the same. As rational animals whose brains have been shaped by Moreau, and as human beings whose brains have been shaped by evolution, we have this incomprehensible longing that can never be satiated. We are frustrated eternally by the inescapability of our origins. The beast people and human beings, Wells are saying, live our lives torn between what they are and what we want to be by way of the values that are imposed upon us by God, religion, and society. Those things that we can never truly obey in spirit because our spirits, our souls, are forever bound up in those animalistic drives. The beast people can stop sinning, but they can never stop being tempted by sin, no matter how much Moreau mutilates their external being. In chapter 10, we had this further commingling of animal and man as the puma's voice suddenly transitions from animalistic screeches to the human cries of a man. So in chapter 10, Prendrick speaks with Montgomery, who tries to reassure him that he's safe and that the creatures that he's encountered, the people that he's encountered, and this whatever it was that was hunting him can't affect him. However, as he is left alone, Prendick hears the screams that emanate from the vivisectionist area, and he recognizes that now those are the screams of a man. He flees the compound, believing that he has been brought to this island intentionally, that by circumstance and fortune, they found him, and now they've designed to use him as part of their experiments, vivisecting not animals, but human beings. Frederick then flees out into the wilderness in chapter 11, where he meets more of these beast people and is uh, introduced to their civilization and their society. Right at the beginning of chapter 11, he says, I was convinced now, absolutely assured that Moreau had been vivisecting a human being. All the time since I had heard his name, I had been trying to link in my mind in some way the grotesque animalism of the islanders with his abominations. And now I thought I saw it all. The memory of his work on the transfusion of blood recurred to me. These creatures I had seen were victims of some hideous experiment. These sickening scoundrels had merely intended to keep me back, to fool me with their display of confidence, and presently to fall upon me with a fate more horrible than death, with torture, and after torture the most hideous degradation that is possible to conceive, to send me off a lost soul, a beast, to the rest of their comus route. So here we see the kind of deep antipathy and distrust that the public can have towards the scientific community, towards the medical experimenter, who we learn, at least in his own mind, but in a twisted way, is working towards the betterment of humanity. The nature of the experiments that he is conducting, their apparent savage inhumanity, lead even Prendrick, who is a man of reason and a man familiar with the biological sciences, to assume or to make the connections to the worst possible interpretation of events. There's something that is degrading beyond all reason and beyond all conception in the acts of the scientist. And this perception is shaped more by public representation. The stories that Prendrick has learned secondhand by way of media accounts of Moreau's actions and his 
expulsion from England than any kind of firsthand analysis or exploration of the experiments and their results. Wells is presenting to us a commentary on the nature of scientific advancement and the exploration of the biological sciences that is not reflected through rose-colored lenses. It's not meant to be a reductive portrayal of either side of the debate regarding, let's say, animal experimentation or the medical practices that are necessary in order to develop new treatments. Instead, it's looking at the various different influences that shape public perceptions of them, while also recognizing that Dr. Moreau as a man and as a scientist is not free from condemnation. We're invited to judge him morally in terms of, first, the public representation of his experiments that's filtered to us through Prendick and that is mediated by way of those news reports that he has received through multiple levels of distancing, but also through Dr. Moreau's own experiments and his self-representation in chapter 14. And it's incumbent upon us then to parse out the truth from both the events that have transpired and the motivations of the man himself as he articulates them. There's a moral question within the work about what Moreau is doing and the ultimate effects thereof whether these experiments can be justified and how they might be justified. That moral question is one that we'll explore in greater detail, but it's one that you should absolutely keep in mind because it will serve as the basis for much of our conversation regarding Moreau, but also the worldview that he evidences, the reasons that he articulates regarding his desire to conduct these experiments and the consistency of that worldview. So as you're thinking about this process of vivisection, but more broadly about scientific research, the development of treatments and uh, best practices within the medical community, and the worldview that underlies it. Think about those moral issues, not about the actions, but about the intentions and also the moral maxims. Why are these characters doing what they're doing? For what is the end? And are those ends and those goals and those means internally consistent in terms of their moral framework? We'll break this question down, but look for that issue of morality as we're going through this text. In chapter 12, The Sayers of Law, Prendrick meets with the inhabitants of the village and learns that they are governed by the law. The law is a series of regulations that are imposed upon them by Moreau that seek to keep in check their various different animalistic impulses. They constantly return to the fear of the house of pain, which is almost like some sort of hellish place of torment and agony that awaits anyone who violates the strictures imposed by Moreau and they've been carved into the flesh of the beast people. Certain fixed ideas are imposed upon them, but at the same time, the structures of their brains, the biochemistry of their brains are altered in order to ensure that they are unwilling or at least predisposed to opposing those instincts. Prendrick becomes all the more convinced that these people are in fact people who have been hideously warped and deformed by Dr. Moreau in, to in order to create an entire race of servile slaves that can worship him as a deity. One of the reasons he might be so predisposed to believing this is that he demonstrates a level of weakness and susceptibility to mass manipulation and to conformity as the beast people begin to chant and sway, frothing and reciting the liturgy of the law. The sayer of the law or the keeper of the law, this simian creature that is wizened and aged, orders Prendrick to recite the law alongside the aggregated beast people. Say the words, said the ape man repeating, and the figures in the doorway echoed this with a threat in the tone of their voices. I realized that I had to repeat this idiotic formula and then began the insanest ceremony. So they begin this ceremony, almost like a ritualistic religious rite. The voices in the dark began intoning a mad litany line by line and I and the rest to repeat it. As they did so, they swayed from side to side in the oddest, oddest way and beat their hands upon their knees. And I followed their example. I could have imagined I was already dead and in another world. That dark hut, these grotesque dim figures just flecked here and there by a glimmer of light and all of them swaying in unison and chanting. So there's something bizarre and otherworldly as Prendrick is transported almost outside of himself, outside of the world of rationality and sense and is caught up in this almost orgiastic litany. 
Not to go on all fours, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to suck up drink, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to eat fish or flesh, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to claw the bark of trees, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to chase other men, that is the law. Are we not men? And so from the prohibition of these acts of folly on to the prohibition of what I thought then were the maddest, most impossible and most indecent things one could imagine. A kind of rhythmic fervor fell on all of us. We gabbled and swayed faster and faster, repeating this amazing law. Superficially, the contagion of these brutes was upon me, but deep down within me, the laughter and disgust struggled together. We ran through a long list of prohibitions and then the chance swung round to a new formula. So Prendrick is saying superficially on the surface, I was caught up in it, but believe me, I wasn't. I was human. I was still sane. I wasn't mad. I hadn't been caught up in the pressure, the force, the orgiastic license granted to them by the liturgy. I, I hadn't lost sense. I hadn't lost myself to the powerful sway of the crowd. The bestial animality of these creatures, the madness. I was still myself deep in my heart. I was laughing at them. Trust me, believe me, please. Prendrick is trying to convince himself that he wasn't so weak as to surrender, to succumb to this forceful madness, stripped of all independent capacity for rational thought and will, subsumed within the greater morass of animal flesh, no longer an individual, but just a part of the group. And that is why he resorts back into his interiority, to his inner being, affirming or trying to assert his independent will. But he can't, because after all, the fervor fell upon all of us, and the contagion was already on him. Even if it's only superficial, if it's only skin deep, he's been infected. As chapter 12 continues, Moreau, using his hounds, tracks down Prendick and forces him to flee again. We'll expand on the function of the beast people and the depiction of the civilization here as we go along. But keep in mind what we've had to say about Prenrick and his being subsumed within the sea of chaos and madness of the beast people as he loses his sense of self. In chapter 13, Prendrick flees to the beach and is hemmed in. He is confined by Montgomery and Moreau such that he can no longer escape and his only avenue of egress is towards the ocean. He has a choice as to whether, in his mind, he will be captured and transformed into one of these beast people, stripped of all will by the mutilation of his brain, or if he will commit suicide in the surf. And suddenly, the, the life, the lingering, agonizing life and death that were uh, promised to him earlier on in the text suddenly seem pleasant, a possible option that he would gladly take in place of the horror that he's experienced on this island. So he begins to wade out into the ocean, intent on drowning himself. Prendrick is convinced to return with Moreau and Montgomery to their compound in order to allow Moreau to explain the actual events that have transpired on the island. As he's doing so, Prendrick is screaming at the assembled beast people who have gathered to witness this argument between Moreau and Prendrick. What happens here? is a kind of laying of the groundwork for the eventual dissolution of the society and the undercutting of Moreau's control of the island. Prendrick plants the seeds of their destruction as he suggests to the beast people that Montgomery is just a human being, that he's just flesh and blood and not a deity. A pair of scientists, Moreau and Montgomery, disarm themselves and allow Prendrick to escort them back to their compound so that Moreau can explain the actual nature of the experiments that are transpiring on this island. And in chapter 14, we have an extensive discourse wherein Moreau explains, well, everything. His intentions, his philosophy, his positions regarding pain, suffering, animality, the human condition, and the very purpose of scientific inquiry into the nature of animal life and the universe. Chapter 14 is going to be at the heart of our discussions of this section of the text in our interactive class. So pay careful attention to, as I said, the worldview and moral outlook evidenced in this section of the work. In the next video, we're going to take a look at some historical background information regarding the status of vivisection in 
H.G. Wells' time and in the time at which Moreau was operating in his fictional universe, so as to better understand the sociological issues that Wells is discussing and also the scientific ones that he's exploring. 